Yeah, Burn Residue is the story of Willie Boyd. He is a mild-mannered gas station attendant with third-degree burns all over his body. One night, a car pulls in, driven by one of the men who lit him on fire. Wow. Yeah, yeah. in the back is a tied-up woman, and he makes the decision as the car pulls away, you know, does he go after a little bit of revenge and maybe become a hero in the process? And things don't go the way he's expecting. (laughs) So uh, the story all starts with him already having the uh, third degree burns and everything. Correct, correct. So the it's a three issue story that we're we have up on Kickstarter. You know, I think it's important when you do something like this that you have something like completed and finished for the audience. You know, I wasn't going to just put out an issue one and then do an issue two and an issue three and hope that you know people get a complete story. So I really wanted them to. You know, if you back, you're going to get all three issues. You can get a single monthly version or a a graphic novel version that Jacob Phillips is doing a cover for. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's uh, something that stood out to me because um, I can tell you the Kickstarter, like companies and projects that I always return to, you know, whenever it pops up in my email, like so-and-so launched a new campaign. The ones I go back to are the ones that deliver the fastest, to be honest. Yeah. And I think it's because there's a thing with Kickstarter because of the delay time. Actually, the box that my computer's sitting on right now is a game that I backed, and like eight, nine, ten months later, it showed up in my mailbox, and I was like, "Oh yeah, I completely forgot about this," <laughs> you know. So uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's really cool that you already have something to deliver on, you know, when the yeah. campaign finishes, because that that helps keep it fresh in people's memory. You know, I think that's. The- that's, you know, everybody has a Kickstarter project out there. It's kind of crazy. You know, there's oh, like <laughs> dozens and dozens. I'm fighting for attention. But, mm-hmm. you know, I, I've i backed a lot. I've backed, you know, 20 plus projects. And I think I've gotten one of them so far. And, you know, that annoys me because I think that, you know, you should be putting your money where your mouth is and have something almost ready to go before a campaign is ended. You know, we started this campaign with issue one completely done. Issue two is being like inked and colored now. And by the time the campaign is over, issue three is going to be in its final stages of being done. So like, that's important to me. So I, you know, if you're, if you go with the single issue version, we're going to release in January issue one. And I just wanted to make a clean year start to it. Mm -hmm. So the camp, the campaign ends in the end of November. You know, you have the December peacefulness, but once January hits, you're going to get that first issue. And then I figure for the people that want the graphic novel, they'll get that in April once everything's all wrapped up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Because, yeah, I do think, especially like when you talk about like comic book Kickstarters, like worst case scenario, you should have something ready to go to the printer, you know? At least, I think you so. know, starting out like that. Yeah, because that yeah. turnaround time is really crucial, especially with uh, comic books, you know. Yeah. Um, pre-pandemic, I'm sure like board games and stuff, they could probably get away with more time. Because yeah. whenever it shows up, you're going to go to your friend's house on board game night and play it or something. But comic books are a very personal thing. And so it kind of like drives this focus, you know, this is like, okay, I paid for this book. Now I want it, you know. And so to me, it's essential. Mm-hmm. A Kickstarter does care. uh like carry through on that promise as quick as possible a lot of times. Yeah, that's like another area where I wanted to make sure people knew that we had something finished to begin with. Like I sent it out to a lot of comic review sites to let them review the first issue. You know, I wanted people to know that this thing is, you know, ready to go. Mm -hmm. Which is exciting too because it, it's almost like it's being solicited in like the previews in the diamond previews you know you see it in there you know it's coming in three months and you can get yourself excited for that time so i feel like that's the kind of time period that you're going to wait for this yeah yeah and i mean th- i think that goes into like a a state of mind that you have to have about it that you know this is something i like this is a passion that i have but at the same time like this has to be kind of business driven you know because mm-hmm. Like I said, a lot of the Kickstarters that I return to, they have very quick turnaround time. So like they're always on my mind, you know, like I never forget about them. So um, to me, that's kind of where the business side comes in is like these are clearly people that are thinking about what am I going to continue doing? What's the reputation I want to build? Because 
like I'll tell you, after like comics, if they pop up in my email inbox, like I'm going over there and backing immediately because like the week that they're uh, after the funds go through and everything, you know, like boom, it's in my inbox. Yeah. You know, like it, uh, less than a week later usually. So that's important. Like you have to have that kind of business focus in order to even be able to do Kickstarter truly successfully. You know, nobody wants to be waiting around forever for something that doesn't show up. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I. I, I think I started this whole thing with probably a couple dozen Twitter followers. So I'm like going in it with like, li- you know, I I did a sci-fi book, a sci-fi anthology book at the end of the summer called Tales from the Dead Astronaut. And I just did that straight. I paid for everything. I got a print run done and put that out. And it was tough because, pe- you know, I was just driving people to my website you know, Kickstarter gave me a little bit of um, uh, more of a platform. So it's been, you know, I took the core audience that had already bought Tales from the Dead Astronaut and then kind of built from there to mm-hmm. get my first round of backers, which is fun, but it's almost more fun now trying to like draw people to it because, you know, they come to a campaign and they can see, you know, you see I have the first, I think, four or five pages on there. I have a pretty detailed description of like a lot of things going down. You know, we, um, I've also been lucky to get a couple creators on board to like help out with the project. Like I have David Lapham of Stray Bullets. He did a original art piece of the main character that we just like put out the other day. So like every backer will get a chance to like win it in a raffle at the end. You know, I thought oh, I could awesome. give it, yeah. I could make it like a high priced backer item or I could give everybody the option to get it. So. Mm-hmm. I went that way. I thought it was more fun and interactive that way. Yeah. Yeah. I always see these uh, Kickstarters. They'll have like for $500 or $1,200, you know, you get this thing. And I'm like, yeah, you know, this project looks really cool. If I just had $1,200 laying around, I might would go for it. But at the end of the day, how many eyeballs that are looking at these projects are seeing $1,200 and buying in, you know? Exactly. I, I think it's more fun. And this is something I've actually talked about a lot. What I really like about Kickstarter is it builds this community because Mm -hmm. once you hit that funding goal, like no longer is it really about me, you know, like all of a sudden I'm on social media, like promoting other people's projects because if other people back, it unlocks these stretch goals. And a lot of times I qualify for those for already being a backer. So it builds the sense of community because now we're all competing for the same prize, you know, like we can all get these things if we all work together, you know, and I feel like a lot of platforms kind of miss that, you know? Yeah. You know, I find that pretty cool too, because there's a couple different campaigns that are going on that I supported and then, you know, I see them coming down to their end of days and I'm retweeting it constantly and letting people know because, you know, I think that's the right thing to do. I think comics is a really, it's a very interesting like brotherhood almost of mm-hmm. creators where everybody is rooting for each other to succeed in a lot of yeah. ways. And, it's, you know, everybody understands the struggle of getting to their funding goal to make their project happen. So there is a lot of, you know, I'm just, you're not asking me to retweet this. I'm just doing it because this looks cool. And I know you're coming down to the wire and let's get this Mm -hmm. out there. And that's fun too. You know, it's, I I would say we've been live for like a week now. It's a week today. We've gotten to about 46% of our goal, which is, you know, pretty good. And in that time, I found way more projects that I'm just as excited about my own, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, that's the great thing um, about like Kickstarter. Um, it's like this, uh, it reminds me of like an app or a social, it, it's really developing into almost like a social media platform. Yeah. Because, you know, your goal is to bring people in because Kickstarter itself is kind of designed in this way to keep people in there, you know, like mm-hmm. it doesn't necessarily want you to go somewhere else, but it wants you to go somewhere within their ecosystem, you know. And so not only is there all these like other projects listed everywhere, things you might like, you know, kind of the Amazon algorithm, I guess. Yeah. But you also get this sense, like even big creators like David Pepos, you know, like he's always tweeting out other people's Kickstarters, you know, and even these small guys that I follow a lot on here, like they'll be tweeting and telling me who they're backing and stuff, you know. 
and, and it's because again like just like the sense of community not e not only like your fans and the projects you're building but the website itself just has like this community uh especially within the comic book section that really just like keeps everything moving because i think we all understand you know nobody that reads comic books is going in every week and picking up one book like they're picking up two mm -hmm. three four books so yeah yeah a lot of times it's a little more pricey on kickstarter but who's going there and only backing one project you know yeah exactly you know the price was a big thing for me too is you know i i it's three issues so when i did my my sci-fi book i made it four dollars plus i think it was like two dollars for shipping which kind of evened oh, cool. everything out yeah. which was like i thought like a fair price for like a 32 page book Oh yeah. And yeah, like I go all the way with my book. Like all three <laughs> issues of Burn Residue are 32 pages. And nice. Like if you back the graphic novel version, it's at least going to be 100 pages. You know, if we end up in a stretch goal situation, I will definitely add more to that and beef everything up. But yeah. like I think it's like really super important to give like maximum value for the right price. Yeah, you know, if you if you back the if you back the the monthly version of burn residue it comes out to be thirty dollars you know and that's with shipping that's with ten dollars of shipping i just made ten dollars shipping across the board yeah and you know it's like for so 20 bucks for three issues you're paying a little more than you would pay for a regular comic but it's like you get that excitement and that thrill of being a part of like this exclusive club that it's yeah. gonna be yeah it's worth it man because I tell you like the 20 22 24 page format that's kind of like industry standard um i find myself with falling, ads. yeah <laughs> i find myself falling more and more out of love with that um outside of like very very uh like episodic stuff um yeah. the flash usagi yojimbo stuff like that like feels really good still at 20 and 24 pages but uh i don't know there's a lot of stuff if if you're doing like a 30, 32 page or a 52 page or even like these um, kind of smaller graphic novels and stuff, you know, like 80 to 120 pages, like that's the stuff that really catches my attention because it's still not like such a long format. I don't feel like investing, but it's long enough yeah. that you really get a story and you can really build something out of it, you know? Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, I definitely see the trend going more that way right now, especially with like what uh, Brubaker and Sean Phillips are doing with them just going straight to graphic novel versions. Yeah. You know, there was a, there was a moment when, when myself and my artist Rosano Pagioni, we were going to go out to publishers as a graphic novel. And like, so I was like, you know, he's from Italy. He, he runs his own, publishing company there which it's actually pretty cool the book is going to come out in italy before it comes out in america oh well, so that's, that's pretty nice that's pretty cool yeah i'm uh, i'm excited to get my italian version right um, oh that's but cool. uh yeah it is cool but um you know i i told him i was like this is the way the market's going but there's another way where we could do you know this kickstarter which he knew nothing about because that's not really a popular thing there really? and yeah it's doesn't hit the same way it does here but um you know i told him i was like well we could do the single issues first this way and then we'll go back out to publishers as a graphic novel but i i i think people just really like that contained read right now you know yeah most top two comics you know you sit there and you read them in the time it takes you to like sit down with half a cup of coffee waiting to cool off and it's nothing yeah. you felt what did i just spend four dollars for 90 percent of this was ads and mm -hmm. this was some jobber wrote this and ugh, this is garbage <laughs> yeah you know no so, yeah i agree like it's just really hard to develop a story that you can get invested in in just like 20 pages like yeah you know, once you once you put all the ads and everything in there it's like 18 to 20 printed pages of comic and it's like how do you build a story you get like what maybe four pages Nothing. for act one and you got like two pages to wrap it up at the end and everything in the middle has to be developed you know it just doesn't work when when i finished the first issue of burn residue and then like got all the pages back and did my own lettering for it and sat there and read it, i was like you couldn't cut a single page of this 
I don't know how you could do it in 10 pages less. <laughs> yeah. Like this is, you know, <laughs> this is a full thing that's just like, boom, like a rocket. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I don't know how these guys do it. They do it because yeah. they get a nice quick paycheck and the editor tells them what to do for the issue. Yeah, and you would think increasing, like at the scale that they're working at, a lot of these publishers, you would think increasing the page count would actually, uh, probably, I would imagine that that kind of nullifies the effects on the uh, actual cost of printing, you know? But yeah, I know. Then they turn around, they can charge like $6 and people will pay it because it's a 32 page book. But honestly, I imagine because of the scale they're printing at, by the time you add another 10 pages, the. You probably wouldn't. The, yeah. Per page decrease at that rate would probably cancel that out. You know, it probably costs mm -hmm. them the same five dollars either way, but now they're charging a six. Yeah, exactly. You know, but I think that's why like the smaller publishers, even including Image, have had a big renaissance recently. You know, uh, you look at Image, you look at mm -hmm. Vault Comics, you look at Boom. You know, they're all putting out. You know, AfterShock, they're all putting out like stellar work mm -hmm. that is getting just as much attention as the newest issue of X-Men. Yeah. I, well, yeah. I can actually tell you the first time, I don't know if it's the first time I ever read a 32 page book, but uh, definitely the first one that I noticed and caught my attention was 2019 last year, whenever um, Sean Lewis did, uh, and what's his name? Hayden Sherman did uh, thumbs and okay. each of those books. I think the first one was bigger, maybe like 52 pages, but the other okay. four issues were all like 32 pages they charged an extra dollar on it. So I was paying like $5 or $6 for each one, but the expanded page count, it just blew my mind how much story and how much payoff there was in every issue. And that was something I kept coming back to like, but there's more pages, like all yeah. these 20 page books. I don't feel like I get invested and then it's over. And then mm -hmm. I'm reading 10 more pages and like, it just hooks me so much better. And I think since then I've really been paying attention to like, oversized format and like graphic novels and stuff like that because it's just a better way to tell a story yeah i mean our three issues is going to be the total amount of like a five issue run you know it, it's yeah. like but like i think that's so important you know i i've been making the great comparison with uh, james tuian the guy that writes batman right now uh, yeah, I've been corrected to Tynan at this point. Okay, okay. I so like his got... Tiny Onion uh, publishing That's imprint, what throws though. you off, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so he's, he's got Batman on one hand, and he's got Department of Truth on the other. And there's just a a great expanse in quality between the two. Mm -hmm. You know, I, re I read the whole, like, Joker War thing. It was like six issues or whatever and i was like what the heck was that that was nothing in the end but yeah. then i read one issue of like department of truth one and two and they're solid dense great pieces of writing and art yeah oh my uh, god the art it just shows you like <laughs> yeah it just shows you like the great difference between letting a creator do what they need to do and then telling a creator what they want you know what you want as yeah. an editor well, I mean, the best ongoing series that I can think of at the moment is definitely uh, Something is Killing the Children, uh, also by yeah. Tiny Onion. So. <laughs> yeah, I haven't, I haven't caught up to that one yet, but I know that's why I hear great things about Oh, that. my God. It's so good, especially if you yeah. like the horror vibes and stuff. Like, it, It's not a horror. It's, it's horror in the same way that like Stranger Things is. Like, okay. It's not really horror, but I guess if you were a kid in the 80s, that's kind of what horror was. Yeah. Um, you know, but it's just got like this eerie vibe and these like well-developed uh, child characters and stuff like it's really good stuff. Yeah. And uh, that to me, that's the best ongoing. Every time it feels like the next issue might drop a little bit in quality or something like it just delivers twice as much, you know, so that's my favorite ongoing. And uh, I know what you mean, though, because like Department of Truth and, um, you know, something that's killing the children like these are books that he's clearly passionately writing yeah. And there, there's an element of passion to Batman. Like a Batman fa fan writing Batman is going to have some passion yeah, to it. Yeah, going to bring it there, yeah. Yeah, but you can just clearly tell that there's like some constraints and some rails there that editorial like keeps mm -hmm. on him with that writing, you know. He gets like these great moments. Um, I read like the first one he did, and then I read like 99, 100, and 101. 
Okay. And so to me, like whenever, like in 99, I think whenever he talks with Harley Quinn, like that, that scene and that dialogue is incredible. The whole rest mm-hmm. of the book is garbage. Like, yeah. I don't know what the point it's, of that whole book was other than that one conversation between Harley and Batman. I was like, this is the best thing in this whole book. That's kind of like with, um, with what they did with X-Men last year when Hickman did Powers of Ten and uh, House of X. And that was like... That, I was excited every week to go to the comic shop and get the new issue. But yeah. then this Ten of Swords thing, I'm just like, uh, the wasted issues in between. I'm like, okay. So I just read I just read 11 issues of setup that didn't need to happen. I was like, you're killing me, guys. Like, come on. Yeah. Where's the quality? Yeah, I haven't, I've never read any of Hickman's work. But uh, especially this X-Men thing, it sounds, I don't know, like very indulgent, you know? Like, uh, if your favorite band, like, they just get so good and they're so incredible. And then, like, they come out with a song that's, like, 25 minutes long. And it's, like, yeah, the first 10 minutes of it, you're just, like, so into it. And you're, like, oh, yeah, this is good. And then, like, five minutes later, you're, like, this is so boring. Because, like, they just get too into what they're doing. And they forget, like, other people have to enjoy this, too, you know? That is the greatest like comparison you could make to what's going on <laughs> with those X Men right now. Because I, I wasn't that familiar with Hickman's work, but I was sucked into the to the relaunch, and I was like, "This was amazing!" And nothing has lived up to the hype since. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, people were really into it, and now like uh, the Ten of Swords stuff that started coming out, people are like, "It's still good, but like I'm tired yeah. of the white pages and all the extra reading and yeah. stuff," you know. And that, I'm like, that "Yeah." Feels- that feels like a cheat too, because honestly, when I see those giant white pages of text, I turn the page. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, let's move on. I always but hate yeah. that because there there are some examples of books that use uh, like comics that use prose, uh, like Undone by Blood and uh, uh, Alienated. Both uh, use some some prose elements to them and stuff, you know, and it worked really well, but. At a certain point, I do feel like if I got to those white pages and Hickman books, I'd be like, I would just get a novel yeah. if this is what I really wanted to yeah. read, you know? Like, at when some ha- point, it's a little too much. When I have 10 minutes to absorb a comic, that's not where I'm... I wanna, I'm like, all right, I'm, now I'm here on this page. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think it's, you know, like I say, it's important to give the reader the maximum value. Mm-hmm. You know, and that was one of the big things, you know, when we first started the book, Rosano, he said he was like 32 pages. He's like, aren't American comics normally like 20 pages? I was like, well, don't worry about what American comics normally are. I know what we can do with 32 pages and let's go for it. And, yeah. you know, like I said, like it, the pace and rhythm of the first issue is just so full stop i couldn't imagine cutting a single page let alone 10 yeah yeah i think that's an interesting point though um with italy in general you know because uh like boom i know boom employs a lot of italian artists and designers and stuff um so how did you hook up with your artists and like get this all into motion and get this character into his head you know i saw his i saw his work online and i just reached out to him i'd finished up my tales from the dead astronaut comic I always been like a fan of like crime comics and I definitely during the pandemic to like keep my comic shop in business, not the only one, but like to yeah. get a little more, I would, I was picking up like the criminal graphic novels, which I hadn't yeah, yeah. read before. So I was like, okay. So after years of like reading like a hundred bullets and stray bullets, now I was into criminal and now I was like, okay, this is where I want to go next. And I saw some of Rosano's art, which was crime work. And I, you know, I I messaged him, I pitched him a couple ideas that didn't land right away. And he was, you know, and he didn't blow me off, but he wasn't that interested. And then I came at him with the idea of the character of Willie. You know, I was like, all right, how about this? Uh, I'm thinking of this character who is like a gas station attendant with third degree burns all over his body. And he was like, okay, all right, let's see. Let me, let me see what I can put together. And he put together the character design, which is on the, like in the story version of the Kickstarter, you can see it. And once he sent me that, I was like, okay, I'm going to build off of this. And we put together a really awesome character. This is the uh, one that's walking out from the garage and all that, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. He's like just shy of a zombie. 
like he it, he almost looks like a zombie in that in that second page reveal yeah and like <laughs> i love it i think he looks so gruesome and perfect mm -hmm. and especially for like a story like this it fits so well yeah um he the character feels inhuman because of where he's been you know throughout the issue we flash back to the life he had before where he was a you know a pretty high stakes gambler that always won and rosano does an amazing job with the colors where when we're in the present day it's these very dark tones these dark blues very heavy blacks and then when we're in the past it's just like bright whites like really you know it jumps off of the page so you really feel the difference and the difference in like the life that he led yeah. and you know through that first issue we really built like an awesome base for a character where we take him in issue two is even more fun and more gruesome and it's just like super exciting to get the pages back also you know when i first started i was like okay you know i got page one back i was like all right this looks cool and then i got page two back i'm like all right this really looks cool and then you know yeah every, every page you get back you're just excited for more <laughs> yeah yeah i listen to a probably too many podcasts and so i listen to a lot of like writers and stuff um and interviews and stuff and th that no matter what level of writer that i hear in an interview whenever they're asked like what's your favorite thing about making comics They'll tell you, like, to this day, whenever I, like, get images and artwork and stuff in my email, like, it's like Christmas every time, you know? Yeah. And, and that that's kind of the defining moment. They're like, you know, you talk about um, Ed Brubaker, you know, I've even heard him talk about it. It's like, yeah, you, you come up with a character and a story and it never really feels like a thing. And you might, like, create this whole outline and everything and share ideas and stuff. And when you get that first piece of artwork back that has that character that you've had in your head and somebody else has brought it to life, he's like, that's it. Like, that's the moment where the story really takes off and, and you just feel that joy all over again. Like, this is real. It's tangible. This can happen now, you know? Yeah. You know, it's I, I told Rosanna from the beginning, I was like, I need to see the character before I really can, like, build the story. And that's exactly what happened. That first piece of art I was, got, I was like, oh, this is our our willy boyd is gonna go through some hell thanks to this drawing. Thanks yeah. to this piece of art. <laughs> and it's it's awesome because you get to be the first mm -hmm. reader too. You know? You yeah. it, and that's what like is even more exhilarating. It's like for someone that really loves the comic medium, every time I get a page, I'm like, oh yes, this is working. <laughs> this is working quite well. Yeah, and it's, it, what's great is being on the time difference because I get to wake up in the morning and I have two, three pages of new stuff. Yeah, and I'm just like, oh, great. I can't wait to see what tomorrow brings. You know, it's like, yeah, that that's another period. very common thread, too, is like different time, uh, different time zones and stuff. They're like, and I wake up and I've got like all these pages, you know, it's just like Christmas every time. Oh, it's beautiful. You know? It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And you said he was doing the he did all the colors, too yeah i thought it was really cool because it does have um you know i don't want to say like uh i guess like it's influence you know there's definitely elements of stuff like uh criminal you know and that i don't want to it's not like monochromatic you know but like a page will just be defined in like blue or green or yeah. something you know but there's all these other colors there it's just like i don't know how they pull that off but these colors oh, do no, an incredible job yeah, it's 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 really great work, you know. Yeah. And like I said, it's you know, I see the pencils and then I see the inks, and the inks are very like sloppy at times too, mm -hmm. before he goes and you know scans it in, and then digitally colors it. So that's super cool also to see. You yeah. Know, like, to see like the rough artistry at work. Yeah, yeah. Their um, image. They did a book last year. It might still be going on, honestly. Um, but it's called. Uh, I don't remember. Not the point. <laughs> it's about like these giants and another planet. It has the most insane interior art. So it, it, the interior art in this book is more detailed than um, than some covers, you know, like, yeah, it's, it, cool. it's insane. But one of the coolest things about the book was not the story for sure. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> one of those. <laughs> yeah. But I stuck around for eight issues because one, the interior art is incredible. But two. It, uh, they had this app for it, and what you could do is you could hold it. It was AR, so you could hold your phone okay. like over the page, and it would have these like three handles at the bottom, 
And so you could slide one handle up and that would take away like all of the uh, the, oh, the colors. And so you would cool. see the inked version of the page and then you slide the next handle up and it takes the ink and you see the pencils, you know, wow. and you could even like blend those. You can move them like halfway and stuff and really see how the, the process breaks down. It was really cool stuff. Yeah, that's super cool. That's super I, cool. I would love to see them. I don't know how much work went into that app and like not just the app itself, but like all the databases they would have to load mm -hmm. all the information. I don't know what all that took, but I wish they would do that with more books because it was pretty incredible. Yeah, that's cool. Thing happened. Yeah, that's really cool. That is, that is really cool. That's a nice like insight into the work process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the other thing I really wanted to ask you about, though, is um, I guess that falls under lettering, but like the sound effects on this page, is that all the artist as well? Yeah. Yeah. He did all the sound effects, just like drew them right on. They're all yeah, like they, they have that like rough feel to it. I was going to say, they remind me almost of like comic strip uh, lettering yeah. or something, you know, yeah. but like in big, bold uh, words, you know, and they, they're they also unique. Like, did you define those words or did he pick what he nope. thought it would sound like? I didn't put one sound effect in. Wow. And he just, you know, it's it's that level of like trust that you got to give an artist, which mm -hmm. as a writer is, at first was like hard to figure out how to do. And once I figured out how to do it, it was, it became even more rewarding. Yeah. It's just like, cause this guy knows what he's doing, you know, mm -hmm. Othon, he knows the art of the page. He knows what we're trying to do. And you just got to let him do his thing and yeah. you come back with some awesome pages. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's in the letters page in like firepower number two, um, Robert Kirkman and Chris Samney are like going back and forth, you know, and, that's something that comes up is the sound effects and stuff. And apparently Chris Samney tends to draw those in on his own. Uh, okay. Because one, he doesn't like kind of the digital look that you get from the letterer doing it. Yeah. But he also likes to incorporate it into the artwork. And, you know, going back and looking through the pages, I'm like, oh, yeah, the way that he like works it into the artwork and he gets these unique sound effects and stuff, you know, things that really just like in a way describe it, but also like let you know what it's supposed to sound like you know and yeah. i think it's always incredible because you think of the artist like visually like he's going to draw a picture that represents these words but to give them the opportunity to work with words as well but in a whole different way than a writer even does you know i think it's a really neat experience and it changes the way sound effects are delivered oh yeah it's super cool the first time i saw it i was like all right just keep going keep going he's like do you have any notes i'm like continue <laughs> yeah <laughs> like what am i supposed to say just yeah don't no stop? i'm good yeah <laughs> no <laughs> and what's crazy he would send me i did the lettering on this version myself which was fun so like as i would get a page in i would i would do the lettering so it was such a such an exciting like journey of putting the whole thing together by like the time i got that last page i was doing those last final touches and i was like oh my god i could sit down I like got it on my iPad to just like simulate it being like a finished page and just went through it all. I was like, all right, we are, we are golden right here. Let's, yeah. let's let people know about this. Right. That's mm. awesome. How do you, um, I don't know how much work you've done before, but how do you see yourself? Are you more of a process junkie where like you're really more into like doing things as they're going or are you more of a, like a completionist, like you like to look back and say, I did that. Um, you know, I think it's probably a mix of both. I like, you know, I'm very, as a writer, I'm very meticulous about the process in which I do things. So I'm very, I'm very into pacing. I'm very into like unique structuring. You know, when I do a screenplay, I don't do a three act screenplay. I do like a five act screenplay. I, I'm very much into like math breakdowns, okay. which is fun with comics because, you know, I go, you know, Alan Moore taught me go write one to 32 on a page and say what each page is and define where your page turns are and like just feel out a rhythm and pace that is proper for that comic book sitting. And yeah. that's super fun. That's I, I think the most fun part of the process is the process itself. Mm -hmm. But again, like once you have that finished book in your hand, it's like nothing else. Yeah. You know, when I did, I did Tales from the Dead Astronaut, which was a sci-fi anthology that I did with this artist, George Luis Gabota. 
and we had a great time doing it. But we started very small. We did, you know, it was never meant to be an anthology at first. I, I had a two-page story that we did, and then we did a, a six-page story. And then I was like, well, what the hell are we going to do with this? So let's do two more eight-page stories and a five-page story, and we'll put it together as a book. So that was like a three, four-month process of doing that. But then I sent it out to the printers, I got my finished copy, and then the first time I sat there with it in my hand as a finished book, I was like, oh, this is an amazing feeling, first of all. Mm -hmm. And then more amazing to like send it out to people that I sold it to. So yeah. that was, it, there's so much about it that every level of it is exciting and fun. Mm -hmm. And you can't ask for more when it comes to yeah. that, you know? Like every time yeah. we get a backer, it's like the most exciting thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean yeah. that, that's uh you know I used but I was I was working in sales and that was that was kind of the thing like you're gonna get a million no's for every yes that you get you mm -hmm. know and every no has to be worth getting that yes that feeling when you yeah. get it you know and I can imagine that's exactly what it's like when it pops up like new backer you're like okay I sold oh, yeah. somebody on an idea like I was yeah. able to convince them that something in my head was worth their time and money you know that's that's an exactly. accomplishment. Yeah. And, you know, it's like you get to the point where you feel like you're harassing people by being so present, you know, especially on Twitter. Mm -hmm. You feel like you got to make like 100 posts a day just so 10 people will see them all together through the whole scroll of it all. But yeah. then, you know, we've had some really good days where we get, you know, six to 10 backers. And it's like, this is the greatest day, Yeah, <laughs> you know, and to see what people, what options people pick, you know. One of the options I have, you get a copy of Tales from the Dead Astronaut. So it's like $5 more and you get that one too. And I've sold, you know, 20 books that way from that, which is super awesome. So it's mm -hmm. like rewarding to see that people want more and people are excited about different things. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and yeah. Just... That's, that's tough with uh, Twitter because I read that the uh, average lifespan of a tweet is like 15 minutes. And honestly, Probably. I don't even believe it's that long. Like, they, it's they gotta say, be like eight minutes or something, man. Like I, I, I felt like I was oversharing too much, and I, I watched a, I watched a video that was like helpful tips, and the guy said, "You probably think you're oversharing, but your, you know, half dozen tweets are probably seen by less than four percent of the people that are even like follow you." So I was like, yeah. "Okay, all right, that makes complete sense." So yep. well, I'm just going to share more and find more right. ways to let, <laughs> you know, it's, it is a numbers game where you're trying to let as many people mm -hmm. know about you as possible and also get them eager enough to like sign on right then and there, you know? Yeah. I also know in terms of Kickstarter, I know I'll watch a Kickstarter for weeks and be like, oh, I'm going to get on this. I'm going to back this. And then I don't back it until the very end. Mm -hmm. But now I know that that creator probably would have loved if I backed right away. Oh, yeah. I was always going to do it, you know, <laughs> if I could have ran his numbers up early. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a huge thing is um, typically whenever you launch, you get like a big influx and then mm -hmm. you get all your like remind me people. And so yeah. there's like this long lull and then right at the end, they're all getting those like, Hey, you got two days, yeah. you got three and they, exactly. they're jumping in and backing in. And it's like that big middle part. That's where everybody gets discouraged because no, it's just I know. like it dries up. Yeah. It's, it's tough. It's tough. I feel like once, you know, we, we had a strong week, but also I know with Kickstarter, you gotta have like things that keep people interested and keep it fresh you know mm -hmm. we had we had the david lapham sketch done yesterday the original art so that i mean i got a huge boost off of that when people finally got to see that and yeah. then you know sometime later next week we'll have the cover from jacob which will be really exciting too so i'm sure we'll get a big boost from that and i think there's a lot of people that haven't backed the graphic novel version that are gonna want to do yeah. that because i know he's going to come up with some killer for us and that's uh jacob phillips that's on uh that texas blood right yeah yeah wow. yeah that yeah, book is so good <laughs> so good yeah i know i i became uh, friendly with chris and you know he had he had read the first issue he gave me some tips on some things you know he gave me some suggestions when i originally was going to send it out as like a three issue mini to image and he gave me some tips so he's like a fervent fan of ours. I just did an interview with him for Backers Only 
on the oh, Kickstarter nice. to make it fun. He, you know, he gave some awesome answers to my questions. Yeah. But then I saw Jacob said that he was opening up commissions and I was like, oh, well, do you want to do a cover for us? And he was game. Then we talked about it and he was like, I, I need a little time to finish some other stuff and then I'll do it for you. And I was like, all right, let's do it. This yeah. is awesome. You know, it's just more fun. Oh, that's stuff. great. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, I've seen an interview with Chris and it just blew me away the way he like thinks about uh like storytelling you know it's like yeah. he just sees like this whole i don't know he, like he has this weird way of taking like disparate elements and like somehow putting them together you know like he, he's the guy that's gonna come up with like some new genre of music or something because like he just sees he can see two things that are unrelated and bring them together you know yeah. look back at like that texas blood that first issue is so different but it completely lays all the groundwork for everything yeah. that's happened from there, you know? That, that was my first question for him in the interview. I was just like, <laughs> you know, I was like, okay, you, uh, I get why you did it, but tell me, why did you do it this way? Because it's the perfect way to start a book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I actually, I, I joke because when I first saw the book, I thought it was a horror book based on one of the covers. I was like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then Probably I was the like- the first one with the zombie, the glowing zombie yeah, guy. Yeah, I think that's what it was. I think yeah, I saw I that the one same first. Thing. So I was like, uh, and then I picked it. I, I ended up picking up issue two first because I saw it in the shop. I was like, all right, I'm gonna, let's try this one. It was like a slower week. And I was like, oh, this is great. And then I went back and I read the first one on, on the image website. Cause they have the number ones there. Yeah. And then I'm like, a, I'm all on board for this one. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, yeah. That, I was uh I was engaging with him on Twitter, you know, and he was talking about uh you know I forget what he said, but I was like, I, I don't understand why so many people fell off from the first issue. Cause I know a lot of people that read the first one liked it and then the second one they were out because they were like, It's not even the same thing. I'm like, dude, like I don't understand why they gave up. And he's like, Yeah, mm -hmm. I really wanted to do that because I felt like it, it set the tone. And I was it like did. Yeah, I was like, it totally yeah. did. Like it sets the tone. I was like, but as somebody who's like from Texas and my dad is obsessed with like that, that area specifically that that story okay. is set in. So like as a kid, we used to go on vacations out there to Marfa and all that stuff like every year, you know? And so for me, the first one did two things. It, it set the tone for the story, but the more important thing it did was like gave you this sense of like lay and lay of the land, you know, and distance and stuff. Because out there, communities are so much different because they're so they're so spread out, you know? And you're in this situation where, like, if you're in New Jersey or Ohio or something, like, your neighbor's, like, six inches over if they don't share a wall with you anyway, you know? And you go out to West Texas, and it's like, you might not even be able to see your nearest neighbor, you know? And so a lot of the stuff that they get into in that book, I'm like, yeah, that totally makes sense. Like, I get it because we're at the diner here, and I can see, like, the house is... 10 miles outside of town. Nobody can see or hear what's going on out there. You know, Yeah, I thought it was really important. That first issue kind of drove us around the town and showed us like how sprawling everything is and what, how it's kind of laid out, you know? Yeah. It's great. Great yeah. stuff. Yeah. I really enjoy that one. It's like one of my favorite finds that I had. And then to just like build a relationship with those two guys was super cool too, you know, especially, yeah. oh especially God. being in that same kind of like genre adjacent, mm -hmm. you know, it's yeah. fun. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know anything else he's done, but uh, that Texas blood is definitely like right on the fringe that, that like nice fringe zone of like popular, like, I don't know, popular, but like far out, you know? Yeah. Like it kind of yeah. hits this perfect area that meshes the two so well, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's great stuff. Yeah, and to get uh, Jacob to do the uh, the cover, man, that's incredible. Because yeah, I'm super excited for that. And you know, yeah. it's like <laughs> it, it makes me feel even better about the project because I don't, you know, some people will say like yes to help out with things. I'm like, well, don't say yes until you've read the first issue and know everything that you've signed <laughs> up for. But then they do, and they're all game. So I'm like, all right, that we're going in the right direction. Yeah, yeah, I'm the same way. Like, I, I want there to be like some kind of like attachment to it, you know? Like, yeah. I think really cool covers. Sure, I'll, I'll pick up a book that has a really cool cover, but to me, the value is in those pages. You know, what's the story? Yeah. What what happens inside? You know, but um, you know, to me, that's another level of value. Like, if you get three books here and they tell a great story, but then there's also this graphic novel version. 
I'd like to have that too, especially if there's like unique artwork on it on the cover, yeah. you know, especially somebody that's, I guess he's an up and comer. I mean, I guess so. He's killing like, it. Like though. he's really good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hate yeah. to call him an up and comer because I don't feel like he's like, you know, up and coming. Know, like he's I here, know. you know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I don't think ride. he's quite like broke through into the mainstream quite yet either. Um, yeah. But I'm excited because, I mean, that dude, like, his artwork is incredible. He's obviously got, um, you know, some great genes for it. But uh, yeah, yeah. still, you know, just to see it, you know, um, you look at, like, what his dad did with, like, Pulp and uh, and Criminal and all that, you know, and it's, like, this very, like, stylized and just, like, really good stuff, you know. And then to see his son be able to, like, do something equally as talented um you know but and, and like his own like genre work you know but it's like his genres it's not like he's just like taking from what he grew up with you know i think it's well, really interesting to, to speak of the two of them it's kind of crazy because i sat there and i over the pandemic i've li I literally read everything that brew breaker and phillips did together and i did it in order so i i've watched sean phillips style like start from very like rugged and small to like just how amazing and perfect it is now. And it's yeah. crazy because Jacob is like where his father is now. So I could only imagine like how even more amazing he's going to get over the years. So I'm just very excited to get a little piece of that with the cover for us. Yeah. 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 I know what it's you mean, man. Like people, whenever they get to, you know, it's like, I don't know, like Tony Hawk, right? He was the first one to do the 900 or whatever, you know. Now kids do that. So imagine yeah, exactly. what they're going to be able to do once they have the kind of experience it took him to get that far, you know? Yeah. Like when you're starting already at that elevated level, you know, like the, the sky is the limit, you know, if even there might not be one, but, but just being able to start off with that advantage, just imagine how much farther it's all going to progress. Yeah. And I, me, I feel like a make a wish kid right here because like everything that Rosano has done is amazing. So like the, our book looks amazing. And then Jacob saying yes. And then like, you know, Chris is like a heavy supporter for us. And then David Lapham has become a big supporter for us. You know, he, I have the image on, you know, you could see it on my Twitter or on my Instagram or on the Kickstarter page, but the image that he did of Willie, just, he nailed the whole story in one image. It's like, when I, when he first sent me the sketch, he's like, how about this? I was like, <laughs> uh, yes, yes, <laughs> this is awesome. Is this the one with the uh, Ace of Spades? Yeah, the black and white one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, where is it? Uh, it's just killer. I was, was going to ask I'm, you about that earlier. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the that's. And, you know, I feel uh, I feel terrible because I'm going to get to raffle that one off and I'm not going to get to keep it in my office. <laughs> you know, I'm going to have to have them do a second one for me. Right. And, like, uh, got to take a picture of it, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's awesome. You know, I'm going to put that in, you know, probably I'll get like um like a card size or a book plate version for all the backers so that they can get a piece of that image too you know with with the issues yeah so it's 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 super awesome to see that stuff and you know yeah. to see you know that little vision you had in your head that started with a gas station attendant with third degree burns and <laughs> how he's evolved yeah yeah that's what i was gonna say like just i mean that's something that came out of your head and has passed through like several artists yeah and yeah it just like it, it's awesome in every way you know for a different reason yeah and that's what makes me even more excited to see what Jay jacob pulls off for a cover because i know he'll take all the elements from all three issues and put together something that speaks to the whole thing yeah 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 that's so gonna it's be pretty awesome. awesome yeah pretty awesome yeah um and i wanted to ask you about uh I mean, you've talked a little bit about it, but Tales from uh, Tales from the Dead Astronaut. This was an anthology you did. Yeah, this was a sci-fi anthology we did. Um, we started off as just like a self-published book. You know, it it kind of started. You know, January of last year, I met I met George, and we started doing little pieces together. And now we've we're gonna do more. And I'll be able to like say more about it eventually, but you know, we got some attention from some small publishers and they want to do more. So that's even more exciting. So it's like, all right, all right. back to the grindstone, like everything happening at once in the yeah. same month. It was like the second <laughs> I hit launch for the Kickstarter, I was like, oh, but then 
now you need to be preparing two more issues of this and this is right. great <laughs> so it's like just snowballing yeah yeah that's that's awesome i mean to get recognized for your work and uh you know keep getting more coming your way yeah. is always uh you know it's it's the oh, highest compliment fun. i don't know what exactly. else could be higher than exactly. that exactly it's like it just feels like uh, someone i read maybe somewhere or someone said it to me but the most addicting thing about making comics is that you always want to make more and it's like okay so you know <laughs> me and rostano are already planning what we do next you know everything is just like all right we do have to finish this but then we should try this you know like yeah it's just so much fun it's like you know i i've spent a lot of time trying to get wheels turning in the film industry and that's like you know that's like pushing a glacier up a, up the sun yeah. You know, it doesn't doesn't really everything's slow and takes forever. And you know, you think something's gonna happen and then it doesn't, and you have to pull together at least half a dozen people just to get one thing done. But then this is like you and an artist just going to work and you come yeah. out with something awesome. Yeah. Yeah. See, I was gonna say, like, you know, in uh you always hear like in the, the film industry, you're what is it, you're only as good as your last project. But yeah. they always want to know what you have ready now or what's yeah, next, exactly. you know? Yeah. And, and comics kind of does that, except for like, you don't hear nearly as many people complain about it. Like nobody's no, because, ever complaining. They yeah, have too many no. books to write. They're no, like, nobody I does. have so many books to write, you know? And then like <laughs> in the film industry, they're like, I got three movies to write. What am I going to do? You know? Yeah, <laughs> it is. It's, you know, it's, it's just like empowering and exciting every time. Yeah. You know, every time I'm like, all right, now back to work. And oh, Rosanna, <laughs> what if we do this? And, you know, I know I know one thing. If we if we make it, if we make it into stretch goals, we're going to do a like an, a one shot that we'll put put out for people. Obviously, we have a ways to go before we get to there. But, you know, yeah. it's like it's just exciting to just keep going forward and doing more. And, you know, yeah. there's an avenue to get things out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's that's all you can do, right? Because you need the experience. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. need the projects and you need the exposure. So why not just do it yeah. all in one, you know, just exactly. keep making more. <laughs> exactly. And that kind of covers all of those bases, you know. It's like so but, much more but, exciting. Yeah, just, yeah. it's a blast. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that's how you know you're doing the right thing, though, and that you're like truly following a passion and not just like, you know, grinding away at everything because you're excited to do it no matter how much is coming your way, you know. Mm-hmm. Like the know, worst pleasure is probably being having to turn things down, you know. <laughs> Let's well, we'll I hope we'll get to get there. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you will, you know, man, I'm sure. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> you know, it's actually it was like fun because it was fun and nerve wracking because every time you send the issue out to someone, you're like, are they gonna, you know, it's it's a dark first issue, and I'm just like, okay, so I'm never gonna hear from this person again after they read it. So that's great. But then people come back and the people that, you know, love it, really love it. And then just become like, like, you know, you have like your own acolytes for mm -hmm. getting the word out there. And you're like, oh man, you know, I, I know um, over on Monkeys Fighting Robots, Manny Gomez has done like two or three articles for us. And he's always like pumping it out and telling everyone, he's like, let's do an interview. I'm going to do a review now. What, what, what else can we do? I'm like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, there's uh, no better form of flattery than, you know, somebody that, that want, likes what you're doing and wants you to do more, you know? Yeah, just like Noah and Matt, you know, I've been on their podcast twice now, the Constructing Comics podcast, and we're nice. just like trying to find excuses to come back on and talk yeah. more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I watch and listen to more Joe Rogan than I probably should, but I mean, that's what he's always talking here. about. Yeah, that's what he's yeah. always talking about, like. I just want to have conversations with my friends and then I accidentally started making money at it. So, yeah. you know, why change anything? You know, it's like now, now he's at this point where he's like looking for excuses to talk to people that he just wants to talk to. Like, mm -hmm. you know, he's like, that's a cool guy. I want to have a conversation with him. What's he got going on that I could like use as an excuse to get to him, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, Noah and, and Matt, they had a, they, they joked that they had a tear on their Kickstarter that was be a guest on the podcast. So then after they said that, I had to automatically go and readjust my reward level. I was like, okay, I'm going to do that one now. They're like, but you don't need to. I was like, no, 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 I want to. This is funny. Yeah, right. 
Uh, Why wouldn't I? <laughs> and now I have to. Now that's the excuse I paid for it. <laughs> don't let them waste your money, man. <laughs> yeah, no, they don't. <laughs> um, the only other thing I really wanted to point out for sure is uh, your website, Space Station Z. Uh, yes. one that is a great name and uh yeah. two like thanks it's such a nice like well done website and there is thanks. so much great information there yeah um thanks. i don't know what all is there exactly if you want to tell anybody so, what they should let's check see out what's on there so uh, the first story that it, that i did with george the artist from tales from the dead astronaut is on there it's a two-pager seek repair it's just a broken robot putting himself together over two pages that was fun then uh, I believe we have the end of times on there, which is a four page story that we did for the platform comics. It was like a quick, like quarantine seven day contest that we did. So we put that one together. So I put it up on there. Then I have my uh, five part short story that I serialized over five weeks, which was super fun back during the quarantine. It's a, uh, it's like a Lovecraftian sci-fi prose short story about a, a scientist and a billionaire who create a the title is the multi-dimensional time box and that's exactly what they've created you know a portal into other dimensions and how it goes horribly wrong and nice. I had a gr I had a great artist Luke Welch do you know I wanted to do like have like a just an image that represented each part so Luke went in and he did you know some pencil and ink work that looks awesome so each each part begins with a nice image that gives you a scope of what you're getting into and then you read the short story which is you know it's probably like each chapter is probably like two pages long and you know i knew most people would read it on their phone so i wanted it to be simple and digestible yeah and that was super fun nice and and you could buy tales from the dead astronaut but i would rather you just go and <laughs> select that backer tier on on the kickstarter and go for <laughs> go all the way yeah yeah that's awesome though yeah uh that sounds great so yeah thanks. like these the imagery just like sets the uh i guess sets the tone for the story exactly exactly oh, that's perfect yeah there. yeah that's great you know what? i wanted something that uh, i guess my my original main source of kind of promotion was instagram so I'm Space Station Z on Instagram. So I, when I when I worked with Luke, I was like, all right, so it should just be like a square. You know, I don't need a comic book page. I need five square images that mm -hmm. would fit perfectly in, you know, an Instagram box. And that's what we did. And they're pretty cool. And I have those original art pieces in there. Super awesome. Nice. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know this is going to sound crazy, but I feel like what novels miss the most is uh, imagery. I and agree. Like, yeah, like to me, one of the most powerful things in a comic book is the establishing shot. When you open okay. that page and you get a little box of uh, oh, yeah. dialogue that says like you're here or something, you know, and then it's just like this great shot of like a background or something like to me that, that sets that whole page up, you know, or usually yeah. even like two to four pages or they're all set up with this establishing shot. And I, I wish, I think that would be a great way to do a novel is like chapter one and then have just like this great establishing image, like yeah. background image or something and then flip the page and this is where your prose starts, you know? And then chapter two, give us another establishing shot, you know? Yeah, it came out of like, uh, as a kid, I always remembered books would have like, you know, an illustration every once in a while. And then the the most recent George R. R. Martin book, recent of uh, two years or whatever, the <laughs> Tale of Fire and Ice did that. Yeah, you know, I mean that's breakneck breakneck pacing for him. So <laughs> yeah, that's true. But but you know that was great. I was like, oh, I love this. You know, you you get a look of how he sees the characters, mm -hmm. and that you know gives you a little bit a little more flavor as you read it. So that's what I wanted to do with multidimensional time box and. The last yeah. image is, is a killer, so that's what I love. <laughs> that yeah. sounds awesome. I'm definitely going to have to check that yeah, one out. Yeah, you should check that one out, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so other than that, I guess just, uh, you know, what's your, what's your pitch for Burn Residue? Why should everybody be picking this up or backing it? Well, you're going to get the most out of your money. It is a three-issue crime story, 32 pages a piece. 
not a single wasted page you get in that single monthly version form which will be exciting because every month you'll get that next piece and i hope you're excited every time you open the book you know you're going to be horrified at times you're going to be you know just sucked in by the art most of the time and you're going to have an exciting ride ahead of you and if you pick that graphic novel version you're going to get a loaded beautiful book that really packs a punch you know it's it's going to be a journey and i don't uh, you know i think everybody that signs up to this kickstarter is going to be part of an exclusive club of the first people to see this book because we're going to go we're going to set the world on fire when we go out to publishers in the end